Hello and welcome to episode 132 of the Clean Energy Show. I'm Brian Stockton. I'm James Whittingham. This week, Tesla is boring AI team members from its autopilot program to work on the humanoid robot. I predict a lot of broken dishes. Ford is moving to a direct sales model for EVs that will eliminate dealer markups. But dealers are skeptical and are rapidly researching alternative ways to antagonize and anger their customers. GM is pushing electric vehicles on American football fans. What's next, low-fat nacho cheese? The Fully Charged Live event is coming to Canada. As Canada's foremost clean energy podcast, I propose that James and I be invited to participate. I could host a panel while James can do crowd control and some light housekeeping. What? All that and more in this edition of The Clean Energy Show. And also, Brian, on this week's show, reducing uh, costs in massive solar farms goes beyond the panels. Potato-like rocks on the seafloor could build EVs, or could they? <laughs> and California will allow human composting in 2027. I'm way ahead of you, California. I'm starting to compost <laughs> myself internally. Yeah. I had a bad week feeling sick, <laughs> but... Uh, yeah, well, I, I, I know you told me you had uh, some type of terrible uh, stomach flu, and, and uh, you're definitely looking better, and I hope that you're better. I just don't want to hear too much about this. Well, <laughs> okay. Let's just say <laughs> I, I said to my ass this morning, can you do me a solid? And it did. That's all. I did it. Everything worked <laughs> out. Um, so, I... Yeah, I, I don't know where it came from, because as you know, I never leave home. You never leave the house. And no one brought it home. No one else was sick. So where the hell did this come from? So but I, it just goes to show you how you could have gotten COVID under the same situation. From too. what, though? The neighborhood cat who I pet I think, in the yard? I mean... Other people come in and out of your house. You know them as your family. Well, I, I do, but it's just, uh, it's an awful thing. And I, you know, I, I'm one of these people who has a phobia of being sick, as you know. Oh, yeah. Uh, I don't know if it's a terrible phobia, but I really hate being sick and I don't do it's it well. Worst. Ask any of my family members. How, <laughs> like I'm the worst patient in the house. I'm just, ah, kill me. Um, <laughs> yeah, so my, my wife, is, of course, is a rock. She births children, something I couldn't do if I wanted to. It's just, um, I, I can't handle being sick. I'm just not good at it. I'm yeah. sorry. And I, I'm just glad it's over and I don't want COVID. Yeah. I really don't want COVID. Um, so far, so good. So far, so good. What's new with you? So around this house here, you might, it seems like this often happens when we're recording the podcast, but you may hear some banging and crashing in the background because- You're uh, like Murphy getting... Brown. You're always getting your house renovated constantly. <laughs> That's right. What's, yeah. What was the name of that guy? I who can't was, remember. <laughs> like Sheldon or something? Or no, no. I don't think Oswald so. Oswald or- He had a good name, but he was Peter, a- Peter, Albert. I don't know. So- uh, yeah, so one, my the kitchen half of my vaulted ceiling has now been spray foamed, and the drywall guys are there already to uh, fill it in. So we're half done, and once that's done, we open up the other half and do that. So I'm going to have a freshly spray foamed uh, ceiling, and uh, I'm real excited about that. Well, I don't, I don't know why you don't have a live microphone in your kitchen. That's what I would do. Yeah, I know that's what you would do, but legally I prefer speaking. podcasts. <laughs> to have that studio sound. Oh, without, well, I just yeah. want to check in on them to hear if there's any sound. <laughs> you know, interesting, well, psh, you know, something like that. Weird sounds would be nice. Okay. And then the other thing was, um, so I bought a brace for my back. You know, I was having back troubles. You bought a and, back uh, brace? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's like news. A, it's like a belt thing that sort of just tightens up and supports your spine when your spine is is feeling week and then you know i know you had this this horrible stomach flu this week so my new idea for the podcast is these are our sponsorship uh, possibilities james like uh, you know all of our old man health problems uh we can you know so this this brace is from a, a company called braceability and they're not a sponsor but hey they are now want to sponsor us i mean you know i could be a spokesperson for this product i thought it was really great oh does it work yeah, it totally works. This is your future. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Commercials on Fox News. And it's better to have on hand now. Like, I, sh I needed it sooner than I got it. But for the next time this happens to my back. Oh, I'll this be is for when to, it happens. Think, yeah, it'll, it'll, I'll be able to move around sooner if I have this brace. And what does it do exactly? 
I mean, it's exactly. Just, you put it in your lower spine, and it's like having a lumbar support. Like, I realize that, like, when I drive a car, I have an extra lumbar support pillow in the car. Like, the one in the built into the seat is not enough. So, when I'm sitting in a chair, I need a lumbar support. And I just thought to myself, hey, well, I need a lumbar support while I'm standing up. Surely there's a product like that. And I just started researching it. And yeah, you get these lower back braces and it just kind of, you know, it, it, it's like an artificial spine on the outside of your body. Now you're, you're endorsing it. Um, and if you're not from North America or younger than us, uh, <laughs> which most people are, by the way, <laughs> uh, Murphy Brown is a, was a TV show oh, right. <laughs> in the 80s, early 90s, yeah. maybe? 80s. About yeah, a, a national news anchor. Or what was it? Was it Eldon? El Eldon. Was that the guy? Eldon. Eldon. Very good. That was the guy's name. Give it some Thank time you. and those old brain cells with the help of a back brace will kick in. And you can help your brain cells with this new product. See, that's how it works. Oh my God. You're sponsors. such a good spokesperson. Yeah. Uh, I, I would have you endure. I would listen to that, that old man um, sitting in front of a couch in the fireplace <laughs> recommending something to me. Um, the car hunt continues on my end. Uh, I have um, a couple of interesting developments in on front. One, I found out the Prius is coming out with a new plug-in prime that is through spy websites and rumor websites. Yeah. Could be a hundred kilometer range, which would right. be interesting. However, yeah. however, it's too little too late, right? I mean, I want a freaking EV. The My partner wants an EV. Um, yeah. I don't want to get an oil change again. I mean, that would do me, and I wouldn't have to worry about charging infrastructure for the next few years. Not yeah. that that's a terrible issue, but the, the, the infrastructure is there. It's just not working, essentially. Yeah. Uh, and just, you know, the inconvenience of it, uh, taking slow speeds. But the, the Equinox, as we mentioned last week, from Chevy, which is a small SUV, they have the gas version of it. It was a very popular vehicle, and now they're having um, an electric version of it as well as the, uh, what is it, the uh, Blazer, Chevy Blazer, as well as Silverado pickup truck. Anyway, the Canadian, uh, where we live, pricing is 34400 For the Equinox. For the Equinox, which is a That's small SUV. The, yeah. the Bolt is a hatchback, which I'm shopping for. Try, would like to maybe, have, would have probably bought if there was one on the lot. Uh, but I can't because there's yeah. not one on the lot and, you know, there's... It's a lottery shoot to try and get one, crap shoot. So, the but the 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 bolt sells for thirty eight for something like that. Yeah, and it's not the Equinox. It's a small car, and no. it and that, they should be marking those down. But but they're not, they, and they have in the states that would explain yeah. the what six thousand dollar reduction in the states, something like that. Uh, so they they said, Canada, we're not going to do it because, you know, we don't need to because, you know, there's we don't sell any there because there's, the demand is too high. There's no competition. Yeah. So screw you, Canada. But this tells me not to buy a Bolt. Like, I'd be stupid yeah. to buy a Bolt, at, especially at the current price. Yeah. Because let's say I buy one and, uh, you know, a year from now, people are starting to buy a $34,000 car that's less and better, and they're going to have to lower the price of the Bolt. Absolutely, yeah. they're going to have to. To, you know, 8000 yeah. less. It's going to probably have conundrum. to be 8000 less. And ideally, you would like to buy a car now, not a year from now or two years from now. Ideally, yes. Um, you know, the, the Prius is, is still fine, but uh, this is, right now, the Prius has an incredible resale value. And that's what I was hoping to take advantage of and get into the, the, um, the game. But you know what? At the price of 34000 it doesn't matter so much what my resale value of the Prius is. I could go yeah. and buy that car. Yeah, that's a... Because it's, a... it's about the same price as the Prius uh, mm -hmm. if you factor in the gas savings over four or five years yeah. at, at most. And that's normal gas prices, by the way, not the ones that we have now or had had recently. Uh, there was a thing going around the internet... Uh, everybody was sharing, saying the Saskatchewan, our province in Canada, which is a prairie province with oil and lots of mineral resources and potash and stuff like that. And farming. And farming would be a perfect place for battery minerals uh, for manus bringing it to Canada because there was an article about that. And everybody's talking about it. And I have 
this contention that is a problem with our province. That is that our grid is very dirty. Uh, it's forty five percent coal, yeah. and they're they're you know they're cleaning up very slowly with very, very slow. small solar projects and small wind projects. So. My thinking is that a lot of these uh, companies who want to buy minerals and build batteries want them clean. They want, you yeah. know, why do it with a dirty grid? So yeah. our province in being backwards and trying to cling on to fossil fuels, a jurisdiction of, there's many of around the world, including the United States, uh, in the in parts of the United States that, you know, you're not going to be competitive. Why would we go to A, the dirty one that has a larger carbon footprint for a battery that we make in your place, then B, that has a clean grid. Yeah. And, you know, 80% of the Canadian electrical grid is clean because of all the hydro, especially in Quebec and BC, right? Yeah. So I, I just, I think it's a, it's a competitive disadvantage for us to drag our feet and few people talk about that stuff. It makes me mad. Yeah, and if you're sourcing minerals for batteries and you have a choice between a place that can source them more cleanly, you're obviously going to go for the more clean source. And speaking of our province, which I vow that I'm going to do less of because nobody knows where we are, <laughs> um, our power utility, SAS Power, which is a government-owned utility, has identified two places to put small modular nuclear reactors. Now, small modular nuclear reactors is something that you claim to study if you want to put off fighting climate change. Yeah. You claim that, no, we can only use these technologies and they're not ready yet. So yeah. they'll decide on this in 2029. But right now, to warm us up and to claim that they're doing something so they can continue uh, mining fossil fuels and, and grease up their buddies on the golf course, Estevan and Elbow, uh, there's two predominant winds where we live in our city. Yeah. And it's both downwind from those two places for what it's mm -hmm. worth. I'm just putting it out mm -hmm. there. Okay. Radiation travels, Brian. Yeah. And I just want to point out that there is a town in our province called Elbow. <laughs> There's a town called Climax. There's a, yeah. a name, name, name me some weird Saskatchewan towns. Regina, uh, one, it rhymes with fun, as uh, Mick Jagger once said. There's one called uh, Kipling, which is the only town in the world named after Rudyard Kipling. Who is? You know, the famous author of The Jungle Book. Oh, really? That, yeah. That's what he's named at? That's what they named him after? How, they, how does that happen? The town of Kipling. I don't know. I, I like this book, so we're going to name it Kipling. Yeah, there you go. Well, that's the the town where the paperclip story went. Yeah, the red paperclip story. Look it up if you want a boring story about the internet. <laughs> uh, and Corbin Bernson made a movie there, too. Why? Because it was famous <laughs> for a day? It's a long story, but I yeah, I don't know. I was once in a movie with Corbin Bernson. We were eating oh, craft right? services together. <laughs> yeah. Did you have any lines in that movie? I had lots of lines. I was quite nervous oh, yeah. about the amount of lines I had. And were you like acting with Corbin Bernson? Uh, no, but I was acting with someone else. And I can't remember his name. I'm sick. Okay. I've got a bit of a fever. Yeah. Somebody famous. It was somebody famous. It is somebody famous. So, um, uh, yeah, you probably don't even know who Corbin Bernson is. If you're oh, right. right, we have to explain we, that. We yeah. have to start stop making old man references. <laughs> Brian, it's just Murphy Brown, and now uh, yeah, that was a TV well, show called L.A. Law. L.A. Law, yeah. See, this is all going to be in the transcript, and people are going to search this, and, and, <laughs> and they're going to be a link to us. The, this podcast talks about L.A. Law and Corbin Bernson, yeah, and yeah, Corbin's going to Corbin. If you're listening, if you looked up your yeah. own name because you're unemployed between shoots, hello. I, Sponsor I, the podcast, please. Yeah, you, you ate a lot of that rice pudding. That's all I'm going to say. You just, <laughs> you went to town on it. Uh, what else? That's about it. Let's get on with some updates to some past stories. And I want to start with this because I have a clip about, uh, uh, we've talked a lot about Beyond Meat, the fake meat, and how it's going to clean up the world. And I'll tell you why later because... Uh, you know, regular beef has a lot of carbon emissions, which I'll get to later. But In Arkansas, a plant-based company Beyond Meat COO was arrested for biting a man's nose. Well, of course, he did. Give the guy a Slim Jim before he kills again. <laughs> Apparently, it was a road rage confrontation in a parking garage. And when police arrived, they found two males with bloody faces at the scene. To which Ramsey said, uh, actually, it's beet juice. It tricks your brain into thinking you're eating real nose. <laughs> yeah, so that uh, 
that uh, has taken a dark turn, the, the Beyond Meat story, Brian. Well, I mean, how could you not make jokes about that? That's just, uh, it, it writes itself. And uh, because I mentioned it last week, and it, it's kind of weird that I mentioned it last week, and then this happened in real life. I was talking about pipeline inspection planes, and I happened to reference a 2013 fatality uh, crash, and it actually happened between the last week's show and this week's show. It actually happened right here in Saskatchewan. Like another crash. Another crash with two fatalities, two people on board. It was near Swift Current. Uh, the federal uh, agency, uh, the transportation agency in Canada, confirmed that a pipeline inspection flight crashed 11 kilometers southwest of Shaunavon, Saskatchewan. So it's a town of uh, 1,700 people, 350 kilometers southwest of Regina, where Brian and I are podcasting from, and that took off from Swift Current on uh, Sunday morning, headed to Estevan, which is about 400 kilometers or four-hour drive away by car. I don't know how much that is in miles exactly. Uh, so nobody knows why, but that actually, it's just weird that I would talk about it. Yeah. And then it freaking happened. Now I can't talk about anything. I don't want to talk about anything. Yeah. Vladimir Putin died by, uh, apple choking. Um, why doesn't that yeah. happen? You heard it here first. Why doesn't that happen? Jeez, it's, just, it's an unfortunate thing. And I was really um, pumped last week to talk about Bloomberg opinion piece on how the supply chain for solar to reach a net zero world, what we would determine the amount of solar we need for a net zero world is already being built. Because I thought it was an, yeah. surprising, and so did they, uh, the people at Bloomberg think it was surprising, uh, an inspiring piece. So I, I just... It's just, if you look at the uh, uh, the current prices of volatile commodities, they say, you won't understand the direction of investment, which is the important thing, is what people yeah. are investing in, where the action is, where, what's actually happening. People talk about, you know, well, gas is up, so oil is good. Uh, solar is up, so that's bad because, you know, there's a big demand and supply chain shortages for different things in clean energy as well. But the direction of investment is insane. We talk about battery factories, gigafactories, almost daily, maybe even daily. Um, such spending is a forecast made flesh, they write, a bet on the direction of future demand taking the physical form of property, plant, and equipment. Um, but anyway, I just thought it was interesting that, you know, solar as a whole generates like 20% at a time. So if you have the equivalent of a nuclear a nuclear uh, power plant, it's it's only actually going to be 20% if you look at the rating of those two things. But the nuclear power plant uh, generates at like 80-90%, right, uh, capacity because they have downtime. So, yeah, it's mm -hmm. not an entire comparison like that. But uh, 940 gigawatts of connected panels would be sufficient to supply about 5.8% of the world's current electricity demand and then another 5.8% every year. But... This is what they're they're going to be manufacturing soon is that 5.8% and that amount yeah. of gigawatts. But that, what I didn't mention, was the equivalent of adding the generation of all the world's nuclear power plants every 20 months, um, which is incredible. Like in, in solar, and I'm not talking yeah. about the maximum output, I'm talking about the actual output of 20% of the solar max. And keeping in mind, if you did have to double the number of nuclear power plants that exist in the world, it would take like 20 years. Uh, At least. That, yeah, <laughs> that's optimistic even. And that's if we started today, right? I mean, it's crazy. Yeah, and I was listening to the Energy Media podcast from Mark and Markham Hislop, and they were talking about these kinds of issues. And, you know, an important point that people aren't quite wrapping their brains around because we're used to energy scarcity. And as we use up the oil reserves around the world, the price goes up because these things get harder to get and it gets more scarce and the prices go up. But the exact opposite thing is happening in clean energy. It's abundance is every time we build a solar panel, we're creating more abundance. And so the price trends down and not up. And it's just something I, people are just not used to. They're not used to it and they just can't wrap their heads around it. Uh, so let's get on with the show. I wanted to start this week with a bit of uh, breaking news, if there is such a thing in the podcast world. Uh, by the way, I've never listened to a true crime podcast before. Have you? Yeah. 
Uh, uh, yes, a couple. Well, I, I listened to Serial because it was in the news because they exonerated the person, or yeah, person's out of jail. Released, yeah. So I listened to it and it's like exactly the same as the uh, Hulu show. The music is almost identical. It's it's almost like a ripoff of the the actual theme of Serial. Like they didn't even try not to exactly duplicate it. You're talking about only murders. Only in the murders in the building. Yeah, only yeah. murders in the building. Rather, they they drew heavily from Serial. Yes, <laughs> and and the woman, the 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 host, it does sound exactly like Tina Fey, which is the <laughs> yeah. kind of like the replacement for Serial, the big podcast. Yes, <laughs> like you would if I told you she was Tina Fey, you would believe me. Like if you didn't <laughs> yeah. know better, right? It's just kind of hilarious. Anyway. Um, Today, at an event hosted by the New York Times, Al Gore claimed the World Bank president is a climate denier. Um, later, on the same stage, the World Bank president, David Malpass, was asked by the New York Times climate reporter, David Gals, if he believed in the scientific consensus that the man-made burning of fossil fuels is rapidly and dangerously warming the planet. Here is the painful clip of that. It's high time to... I also want to give you one more chance to directly address <laughs> former Vice President Gore's claim that he made on this stage that you were a climate denier. His words. So, very odd. I've never met him. He's not involved in the efforts that we're doing. He may present as a climate person. I don't know what impact that's having. Okay. Do, let me just be as clear as I can. Do you accept the scientific consensus that the man-made burning of fossil fuels is rapidly and dangerously warming the planet? I, I, I don't know if everyone wants to comment on that. At what we are doing is having impactful I, projects that reduce will, greenhouse gas emissions. you answer the question? Emissions. We have a mission of a World Bank that's powerful. Will you answer the question? Is that... I, I, I don't even know. I'm not a scientist. So there you have it. Um, what a douchebag, if I may say so. Yeah, well, I mean, he's not a scientist, but... <laughs> yeah, I can't gonna... comment on it. I'm not a scientist. You're not a scientist. My so play we should erase bed. all the episodes of our podcast because we're not scientists? I guess so. I'll get out the magnetizer. <laughs> <laughs> For our younger listeners... <laughs> <laughs> Audio used to be recorded on magnetic tape, which you could erase with a magnet. <laughs> what? That's crazy talk. I don't know what you're talking about. How do you erase audio with a magnet, Brian? You're, you, you truly are not a scientist. I have a bulk tape eraser in this room. Well, it's a good thing you didn't turn it on with my magnetic head, because, you know, my <laughs> head is mostly metal now. So, yeah, I guess the answer to that is yes, the World Bank president is a climate change denier. Okay. Um, GM is looking to football to capture a broad consumer base and bring all of its nearly 3,000 U.S. dealerships on board to sell EVs. For the Equinox, Chevy is banking on a 300-mile full charge as the pivot point for consumer appeal and for football's fascination with commercials to open the door so EV cynics might take a second look. And I saw, I was actually watching football on the weekend and saw these commercials and said, dang, I want one of those. <laughs> with a GM estimated up to 300-mile range on a full charge and a starting price around $30,000. It's everything you want in an electric SUV. Chevy Equinox EV. Finally, an EV for everyone. I mean, that's true. It is an EV for everyone. Uh, because yeah. it, it is the, mod, the the form factor that people buy the most after trucks, I guess. Uh, it is the very popular size. You can't say it's small. You can't say it's expensive. EVs are too expensive because it's only 30 grand in the States. And that's, they're telling you that in the commercial. That's 35 but, grand less than a Model Y, Brian. But how many are they going to make and when is it for sale? It's for sale starting in a year. Production as any EV will ramp up slowly, perhaps faster than Tesla because they are a more established manufacturer. They know what they're doing. These are going to be made in Mexico. They say they have enough batteries for a while, for a long time, actually. And they're actually, you know, it's just hard to argue that it's 
for 30 grand though, it's, it's hard to argue that it's half the car of the Tesla. Like Tesla's going to have to once, you know, once people, once they do make these and I, it won't, it'll be two years from now before they're up to full speed. Let's face it. Yeah. But once that happens, they're making the Blazer, they're making the Equinox, they're selling them at prices that people can afford. EV adoption acceptance has moved a bit further down the road a year from now. Tesla's going to have to lower their prices. I mean, they're, they're a bit high now, don't you think? Oh yeah, they're definitely high. Um, but they still have, you know, a backlog of orders, so they don't have to lower prices anytime soon. But this is what we've been waiting for. This is all good news. I mean, you know, more available. This is what the world needs. And Hertz is going to buy a bunch of them. Yeah. No, this is sort of an addendum to that story. Um, Hertz had previously uh, ordered 100,000 Teslas. Um, that was supposed to be by the end of 2022. I'm not sure if they're on track for that. But they are now going to add 175,000 EVs from General Motors. This is from different brands of General Motors. So this would include Chevy, Buick, GM, C, Cadillac, uh, Bright Drop, which I think are those vans. Um, so this will take a while. Um, but, you know, this will also impact you again. Because yeah, I was if you thinking want that. one of these Chevy Equinoxes, um, you know, it could be that Hertz is in line in front of you. This those is, bastards. You know, we're, we're still going to have these supply and demand problems for a long time to come. You know, we learned a bit about, on a previous episode a few months back, about how this works. Usually an automaker uh, gives a huge discount to these types of rental car companies for buying yeah. huge volumes of cars. Yeah. And then the point where it becomes profitable to resell it is actually very quick. It's under six months. Yeah. It's sometimes three months. So they very quickly resell these cars because they got them at a price that makes a profit to sell them already because yeah. of the discount, right? And, and then they, they always they, have new cars in stock. Right. So they find the sweet spot where it's the most profitable and you're selling a practically brand new car that's three months old or whatever. Lots of kilometers perhaps, but perhaps not depending on how it's used. But uh, yeah, and then they make profit off it. Now Tesla notoriously did not give one penny discount, Elon Musk said. Yeah. Because they didn't need to, and they couldn't make the cars any faster than they're making them. So why give a discount if you have uh, too many orders to fill anyway? Yeah. So that's, that's one thing. And another thing is <laughs> fully charged is coming. Yeah, to Canada. Yeah. So if you don't know, this is um, primarily a YouTube channel hosted by Robert Llewellyn, probably the premier you know, clean energy and electric car channel on YouTube, fully charged. And they've done live events in the UK before, and they've done two live events in the US, in Austin, Texas. And then the most recent one was uh, San Diego, which just finished. I'd kind of been hoping that you and I might get down there for that one, but we didn't. But now it's coming to Canada a year from now in 2023, the fully charged live show. So I thought that that was a super fun announcement. Um, it's they cited several reasons for coming to Canada. I think the main one, though, is that BC Hydro, the electric utility, uh, seemed to have offered them a large uh, sponsorship. So they seem to be the prim primary entity that's inviting Fully Charged to come and do this live show uh, in BC. So uh, BC Hydro, like it's uh, the province of British Columbia, 98% clean grid, mostly from hydroelectricity. And so they're very interested in clean energy and they... Uh, I guess, are fans of the Fully Charged channel. So they decided to, uh, yeah, invite them to Vancouver. So uh, this is September 2023. And uh, if anyone from Fully Charged is listening, please invite James and I to come. We'd love to come. Uh, I think we should get our charged. fans to lobby for us to be there. Um, yes. So, yeah, send emails. Um, Bother, knock, knock on Robert Llewellyn's door if you know where he lives. Three in the morning. You know, <laughs> you want to make sure you got his attention. So don't, don't do it during daylight hours. Yeah. So yeah, I think, uh, I think that's going to be a lot of fun. So this is a kind of a large sort of trade show and gathering of, of clean energy enthusiasts and electric car enthusiasts. So there'll be lots of kind of panels and discussions and um, uh, places where you can go and look at electric cars and presumably like um, home heating stuff. They're very big on heat pumps in British Columbia. Um, they're somewhat milder climate for Canada. So heat pumps make perfect sense for British Columbia. 
And uh, BC Hydro has sort of subsidies and programs to help people buy uh, heat pumps. So, uh, yeah, I think that's, uh, that's going to be a lot of fun. So you anticipate us being there, don't you? Yeah, I think we should totally go. Well, I'm going to have to start a GoFundMe then because... <laughs> Like right now. Well, I, I can drive you in the <laughs> Tesla. I can pay for the charging. Uh, but what if I get norovirus from you? Well, I, that is I don't do sick well. It's true. That'll be the place where I get COVID. But if I got COVID somewhere, you got COVID at a conference. Yeah, yeah. I mean. So maybe I would too. I don't know. Well, this will be at the Vancouver Con Convention Center, which is a big, nice, open, airy kind of place. We so. should also say that it's Canada and the Pacific Northwest that they're kind of making it kind of for the whole region up there. Because it is a long way to go down to, uh, you know, San Diego and Austin for us. Yes, but this is very close to Seattle is the American city just across the border. So this is, yeah, definitely the Seattle, Vancouver area. And uh, I think that's going to be great. You can buy tickets now. They're about $75 for the weekend for the three-day thing. You can also set up, you can get sponsorships and and set up, uh, you can sponsor the event. You can set up a stand there as well. So we should do that. I don't know. Yeah. Just a, <laughs> a tiny little one square meter booth. We can have a little table <laughs> and we can sell podcasts on cassette tapes or something. Sure. <laughs> Get your podcast here. <laughs> Maybe USB drives or something. Uh, okay. So, and sticking to uh, EV news for a second here, Ford um, is looking to change up their dealer model going forward um, under EV. So they're, they're trying to split their business into kind of three sections at Ford and model E is going to be the electric division. Um, then there's going to be Ford pro that handles commercial vehicles and Ford blue oval, uh, which will be their legacy internal combustion things. But anyway, so, um, they're trying to revamp the model for their dealerships. They want to keep the dealerships, but they need to change things up in order to be competitive in the 21st century. So, um, it's going to go to more of a direct selling model, like with Tesla. And so the, the dealers are going to have to choose, much like uh, General Motors is doing this as well. You got to choose to be into the program with Model E, and it will cost the dealer some money to kind of set themselves up for that. But um, it seems like a good strategy. Like there, there needs to be um, a rethinking of the dealership model, um, especially if you're trying to compete in the new world of EVs. But, um, you know, also nobody really likes haggling for prices at dealerships. I God, think. no. So it's the worst thing in the it world. It is the worst thing. So this would set a set price for their cars going forward. Everybody pays the same price. Um, you know, yeah, haggling at a dealership is the worst thing in the world. It is for everyone because, you know, it's just... Yeah. The one thing, we, we have one Toyota dealership here, so I couldn't walk elsewhere. I'd have to yeah. go quite a ways, actually. I'd have to go, you know, hours away. Well, one hour away. Yeah. But th that dealership was owned by the same company. But <laughs> yeah, with Chevy, right, yeah. there's one on every street corner. Yeah. There's a, a Chevy dealership in, you know, every 200-person town pretty, pretty much. And it's weird how it sort of developed this way because we are not a haggling culture. Like, we don't typically haggle for prices in Canada. You just walk into a store and you pay the price. It's, it's a common thing in other places sometimes to haggle, but for some reason it's only cars and it's an expensive thing. So, you know, if you do it badly, it costs you a lot of money. Yeah. And culturally in North America, the man of the household goes and does the dirty deed <laughs> and then brags to his friends, right? Yeah. And then, and if you, if you don't, then you're not a man. <laughs> You're a terrible human being, a failure. So, yeah, yeah I hated it. I hate and that. I did enjoy the experience of buying a Tesla online, which you do online. You put the deposit down with the credit card. I will say there was more human interaction than I expected because when you're exchanging a large amount of money like that, um, you still need to talk to a human. So I had to talk to the Tesla place in Calgary, which was the closest at the time. And then we had to do a wire transfer for the final payment for the car, which was kind of nerve wracking because it's, it's a large amount of money. And, you know, like somebody at the bank said, you know, this is really important that you get, you know, every digit right or anything like your, your money could just go off into the ether. That I think. is a lot of money. I spent, I sent 10 grand to Montreal for my leaf. Yeah. yeah. And I, I felt that experience and yeah. I was like, I, cause I didn't hear back. It was like, yeah. And, and then the bank people spent an hour and a half walking in the back room, trying to complete it. 
And, uh, you know, the manager came out, the janitor came in and was <laughs> offering his two bits. And yeah. it was like tense. It was terrible. And then ultimately, and the other thing that's weird about this, and I know this through just sort of online banking transfers and stuff, for some reason, these take a couple of days, even though it's electronic, it takes a couple of days. So I had to send a screenshot of the wire transfer to the Tesla people in Calgary because they wanted to release the car. Like they had a truck leaving to deliver it. And they're like, oh. we got to release the car. So send us a screenshot to prove that you sent the wire transfer because they hadn't gotten it yet. And they had to send the car. I mean, they didn't have to, but they, they sent the car on its way before they actually got the money. Oh, well, that's cool. Uh, yeah, I, I, you know, I wouldn't haggle. I wouldn't even think about haggling. I don't think if I didn't read online that the average haggle price down for this yeah. particular model in your region is this much money, yeah. $1,700. And I thought, ah, ah, ah I'm not going to leave $1,700 on the table. Who am I? Yeah. Gandhi? And there's more resources now on the internet for us for that kind of information. So, but that it doesn't really make it easier. It just makes it more. No, <laughs> it makes it harder because now you feel the pressure. You know <laughs> what you have to do, and they know that you know you have to do it anyway. Uh, San Rafael, California based uh, Ojo. This is a company that makes uh, solar mounting hardware for solar farms. They have a new way to mount solar panels. And the reason why I mentioned this is because we always talk about the reduction of costs and eff efficiency increases of the panels themselves. Well, there's other stuff involved. There's hardware. And if you can get that down in price over, and you're putting on literally millions of panels, and then you reduce the yeah. cost of the things that hold those panels up, that's a lot of money. So they're talking about using 50% less steel and labor, because labor is an issue too here, than the conventional pile system, which is what we saw at the solar farm near here. So the Earth Trush combines its patented hardware with a drilling machine. They have their own drilling machine, specialized drilling machine. And basically they have, you know, two piles that go in and form a A shape. And at the top of that A shape uh, mounts onto the uh, pivot of the solar um, array uh, that holds up the panels and, and either tilts or is steady. So it's just 50% less steel. They're, they're always coming up with new things to bring down those costs. And when you bring them down, then the cost of solar electricity, period, yeah. becomes less. Yeah. It's, it's crazy. And they're still, they're doing that. They're also improving panels too. So that's happening. Yeah. Although all those small efficiencies range. in whatever business make a huge, like I'm staring at a box of like Apple MacBook Pro boxes like that I've bought over the years. And even though the laptops often get bigger, the packaging gets smaller. And it's because like every millimeter that they can decrease the size of the boxes, the more they save money. I mean, first of all, people want less packaging, but you know, the smaller the package, the more you can put in a truck or on a ship. It's, you know, every little bit counts. All right. Coming up with the show, the lighty run will breeze through the latest in the uh, week's clean energy headline news. And we have some feedback this week. Uh, let's step into the mailbag. It says, hi, I'm a big fan from Denmark, embracing green energy, driving a Tesla, I have solar panels on the roof and an air to air heat pump to keep the house warm. So go on all electric. I enjoy listening to your program. I think it is great what you do to enlighten people on the progress on clean energy and also in a fun way. So thanks a lot, he says. Thank you. God, it's a always boosts our wind in our sails when we hear nice letters like that. And he says, I just wanted to share with you how far we are here in Denmark and Europe. The electricity prices are going up and down like crazy here in Europe. The price varies from hour to hour, but the price is determined by the most expensive source, which is usually gas and coal. Interesting. Uh, I won't read you the whole letter, but I'll uh, read you parts of it. Many homes have uh, variable price contracts with their provider, which you can choose freely. You could even choose Swedish nuclear uh, if you want. And in Denmark, we have a, no nuclear power, but a lot of wind turbines that produce around 45% of our uh, electricity on average. And on windy days, like today, when he was writing this letter, it was 120% was coming from wind. So that means that they exported their energy to their neighbors and the price goes down and sometimes is negative. Already we're seeing negative prices. I can't get over that. So green energy is the only source that can bring the price down in this crazy time. And he has some other information and uh, some things that he has done. He's got a 6.6 .6 kilowatt uh, peak 
power uh, solar system with a 6.5 kilowatt hour battery. Uh, enables them to charge the battery at night when the power is really cheap and use it in the morning, sell it back to the grid, yada, yada, yada. You know how it goes. And he says, uh, so the battery can also be used in the winter where there is little sunshine. And Denmark is as far north as Laloth and Lalosh is in Saskatchewan. And what a great guy for looking up our local town to give us an idea yeah. of where Denmark is. That's, that's very sweet. Thank and you. Lalosh is quite a bit farther north from where we are. Yeah, hours and hours and hours. So uh, we, have, we live in a massive, everything in Canada is massive. Ontario is like, I, I think it's uh, the size of some planets. It yeah. it's, <laughs> takes days to cross. But Saskatchewan is very tall. And most of us have never, you know, been anywhere near the top third, let alone, you yeah. know, it's, it's just insanely big and it becomes wilderness up there as well. Uh, so the future is here now. And I think the future looks bright and for clean energy and thanks again for a great show best regards from Sven the Green Viking in Denmark yeah and in there was a link to a website where you can look at a graphic that kind of shows you where the energy is being generated there in northern Europe and Scandinavia and you know which direction the power is going sometimes it's going um, you know from Norway to Sweden and sometimes from Sweden to Norway and Denmark and, and so forth so yeah I thought that was really interesting so thanks Sven we got another note from someone who said that uh, my son's university prof, like my son, James's son, my son, uh, he, he said there's not enough lithium in the world. It was mentioned in the show last week, yeah. and he gave us a link to a YouTube video. But it's just some dude. Yeah. It's You can't rely on everything from some dude. I, I know it's true, but maybe that's not the best link. Yeah. You, no, it's true. I, I mean, th this podcast, we just regurgitate information from other people. That doesn't mean it's true. I mean, hopefully it is. Hopefully it is, because we try to pick reliable sources, and we also try to verify things and and have uh, second looks at things, especially if we're if it, if we're doubtful or if it's a smaller uh, media outlet. So we love to hear from you, as you could tell, especially when you send us praise. Contact us at cleanenergyshow at gmail.com on Twitter or TikTok. Our handle is cleanenergypod. And don't forget to check out our YouTube channel for visualizations of this podcast and other things and special features. And uh, Brian, it's time for the world famous lightning round. A fast paced look at the week in clean energy news. General Motors said on Tuesday. It is ba General Motors said on Tuesday it is backing tougher federal. I'm going to do that again. I have to do that again. It's time for the lightning round. A fast paced look at the week in clean energy news. General Motors said on Tuesday it is backing a establishing tougher federal emission standards to help ensure at least 50% of new vehicles sold by 2030 are zero emission. Now, you'll recall that the uh, CAFE standards that California and other states set before were opposed by some car companies. Yeah. Uh, and uh, Toyota was one of them. Yeah. I'm just going to mention that. And But now, General Motors, who are all in on EVs, say, bring it on. Hell, speed it up. And you know why? Because their competition in Japan are going to be screwed. Yeah, they're ahead of Japan. <laughs> Way ahead of Japan. Yeah. And then arguably ahead of a lot of people who are not Tesla. So, or Rivian, or other people who are uh, fully EV. The founder and owner of the outdoor apparel brand, Patagonia, Yvonne Chouinard. Chouinard? Chouinard. Chouinard. I don't know. We'll call him Yvonne. Has given his U.S. $3 billion company away to a specially designed trust ensuring all profits in perpetuity are used to fight climate change and preserve wild spaces. That's which is that unusual. Man. He gave his whole company yeah. worth $3 billion just for this. So that's amazing. Powerful statement from Antonio Guterres yesterday at the UN General Assembly. He is calling on nations to tax fossil fuel companies. It's high time to put fossil fuel producers, investors, and enablers on notice. Polluters must pay. And today I'm calling on all developed economies to tax the windfall profits of fossil fuel companies. Those funds should be redirected in two ways. 
to countries suffering loss and damage caused by the climate crisis, and to people struggling with rising food and energy prices. Yeah. Um, I hope people do that. I hope um, developed countries do do that, and because I've had it with fossil fuel companies. Yeah, and as we know, uh, wealthy countries um, tend to do better in these sorts of things, and the poorer countries are the ones that are getting the short end of the stick, as usual. Oh, it's time for a clean energy show fast fact. Beef has the worst average kilograms of CO2 per kilogram of food at nearly 100. That is to say, one kilogram of beef... 100 kilograms of CO2 is produced for that one kilogram. That seems insane. Can you guess, Brian Stockton, what major food group that James loves comes in second? <laughs> in terms of CO2 for a food? Yes, in terms of CO2. And uh, I won't tease you any longer. It's dark chocolate, which what? is at half. Oh, no. Can we not have good things? I, oh, man. Do we have to start eat, stop eating dark chocolate? <laughs> I love dark chocolate. No one's talking about stopping to eat dark chocolate, but we're talking about stopping eating beef. We, we eat a lot more beef yeah. than kilograms of dark chocolate, except for possibly me. <laughs> <laughs> for every kilogram of beef, there's a kilogram of dark chocolate in me. That's basically the two things I eat. A little bit of beef, a little bit of dark chocolate, washing it down. From Ars Technica, we talked about gas stoves releasing hazardous air pollutants before while they're operating. But even while they're turned off, according to a new study, some of these leaks can go undetected. And although gas distributors add an odorant to the natural gas to ensure that people smell the leaks before there's an explosion risk, the smell may not be strong enough for residents to notice small leaks. Some people have a much stronger sense of smell than others. My daughter was telling me this the other day, yeah. and I thought she was crazy. No, they're super smellers. There are people with insanely sensitive noses. And you have to think the guy at the supermarket who smells with terrible B.O. is one of these people who can't smell. Yeah. Like, what happens to those people? They just get used to it or what? Uh, yeah, but people have different senses, different senses of smells. Uh, I just want to know, is my deodorant working? If you people would tell me, I hope you would. Uh, in particular, those who have lost their sense of smell, whether from COVID or other causes, may not smell large leaks even. So one study found that 5% of homes had leaks. 5% wow. with natural gas. That's terrible. Do you still have natural gas in your stove? I do, the cooktop, but I've been shopping around for induction cooktops and hope to put one in soon. And they'll probably put it in during the podcast. <laughs> yes. I've been hearing drills and saws. I don't know. Hopefully it doesn't make the uh, microphone here. Oh, I think it'd color up the podcast wonderfully. Add some texture to it beyond my illness this week. Uh, the same study showed that leaking natural gas contained multiple hazardous air pollutants, including benzene, a cancer-causing agents. So boo to that. From Clean Technica, Pan-African Resources, 10-megawatt solar plant in South Africa saves $170,000 a month on the gold mine's electric bill. And that takes about five years to pay off. But after that, Brian, it's gravy. Gravy. It's like having a gold mine. Totally. <laughs> I'm laughing at myself. Uber has announced its Comfort Electric program is expanding to Canada and rolling out to more cities in the United States. The Comfort Electric program launched back in May, allowing customers to specifically request a ride in an electric vehicle like a Tesla, Polestar, Ford Mustang, Mach-E. What do you think of that? Yeah, that's interesting. And I don't normally take Uber because I have a car, but I, when I had my back problem, I, I needed to take it to uh, an appointment I had. So I took an Uber and you could choose an eco Uber was one of the options. So I thought I better try that and it gives me something to talk about on the podcast. So the car that came and got me, it must have been a, a, like a Corolla hybrid or something. It, it was, you know, I was hoping for a Tesla, but no, it was just a, it seemed like a normal Corolla, but I'll give them the benefit of the doubt and assume it was a Corolla. It was a four-cylinder, which qualifies as an <laughs> eco car yeah, in this you know, market. Here. But then on the way home from the appointment, I thought, well, I'm in a hurry. I'll just pick whatever. And I got picked up by the largest SUV I have ever seen in my life. Is that right? Why yeah. use that as an Uber? Why? It seems an odd choice to use as an Uber vehicle. Oh, my God, especially nowadays. Yeah. Uh, from Wind Power Monthly, uh, update your subscription, people. Nordex boosts a 6-megawatt onshore wind turbine rotor, and it's going to be 175 meters off the ground. That, that is uh, taller than the Washington Monument. 
uh, six megawatts onshore. We talk about offshore a lot and the, you know, the 14 megawatt turbines yeah. that are out there now. This is almost half that and it is onshore. Interesting. Cool. Oh, it's time for another CS. CES fast fact. How many of the giant GE Heliod X offshore wind turbines, which I just mentioned, which are 14 megawatts, would you need to power all of Great Britain, Brian? Hazard a guess. Um, I will say a thousand. Six thousand. Six thousand. Six thousand the power to power all of Great Britain. Did I say the US at first? I don't remember. <laughs> Check the tape. I don't listen to the show. Get the get the magnetizer out. <laughs> Erase the tape. <laughs> <laughs> These old men on this podcast were talking about magnetizers. <laughs> Rand promises electric pickup lineup that will challenge Ford and Rivian in range and beyond. So finally, Ram is the last people. We were yeah. wondering when that was coming. There it's we are. all coming. Bring it on. Daimler has unveiled their long range transport truck. This is a, a semi for the highway. Has a 600 kilowatt hour battery and a 500 kilometer range. There's about 300 miles. We use LFP batteries, which is the cheaper batteries, less energy dense, resulting in a shorter range for the same weight. But Mercedes says it is gaining in longevity because the company says it expects the vehicle to last for 10 years, which is a lot for yeah. a semi truck and 1.2 million kilometers or 750,000 miles. And then you could probably just put in a new battery because the other components would probably be in pretty good shape, I'm guessing. Yeah, I'd be a little surprised if LFB batteries are kind of energy dense enough to work for a semi. Because the semi's also got to carry a big load. So if the batteries are too heavy, it kind of takes away from your payload. But, um, you know, obviously they think it'll work. Oh, look at this, a bonus. <laughs> CES Fast Fact. Brian, the... Balda Solar Park in Germany is the largest solar farm in the world. You said uh, About, you said Germany. What is? I've got a fever. <laughs> the Balda Solar Park in India is the largest solar farm in the world. About one billion dollars per gigawatt. That's uh, you know, yeah, nuclear reactor is about a gigawatt, right? Okay, right. so it produces two point five gigawatts of power, or about two point two. Five nuclear reactors. Given solar is 20% of its peak overall power output, that means about $5 billion per equivalent nuclear re reactor with only storage considerations. So you wonder what, it's just another case of what the um, the cost of solar vis nuclear is yeah. without storage, and it's about $5 billion per reactor right now. But that's getting cheaper, and we expect that it's going to half in the 2030s. So that's, that's incredible. Oh, and from the... Uh, Late Show with Stephen Colbert. We, we have not sorted them, you know, cited them as a, a source before. Yeah. California is planning legislation to allow human composting. Starting in 2027, Californians will be able to choose human composting as an alternative burial option. Great. Oh, sure, you clap now, but it's one more recyclable to keep track of. Honey! Honey, I know eggshells and coffee grounds are okay, but what about Uncle Rick? Is he compost or disposal? The first state to allow human composting was Washington in 2019. Other states that have legalized the practice include Oregon, Colorado, and Vermont. It is a problem because, you know, it's, we, we cremate a lot of bodies and we probably don't need all those uh, carbon emissions. And finally, this week, Tesla loses its infamous most shorted stock title to Apple. Your thoughts, Brian Stockton? Wow, that's amazing. I had not heard that. I mean, it's Apple's probably a bad choice to short as well. I don't know why people would short Apple. Um, These are two things that you love, Tesla and Apple. I Yeah. Um, you, you just cited all the Apple boxes you have. <laughs> and they're not for Apples. They're for <laughs> MacBooks. So Yeah. No, it's true. I mean, you know, it certainly the growth days of Apple are behind them, so they're maybe not the powerhouse stock that they once were, but they seem on very solid ground. So uh, shorting Apple is probably a, a bad idea, just like shorting Tesla is a bad idea. Well, that is our show for this week. We'd love to hear from you again. Our contact email address is cleanenergyshow at gmail.com. Pick up your pen right now. Send us a message 
because we love to hear from you. Clean Energy Pod on Twitter and TikTok, YouTube channel, speakpipe.com slash clean energy show. That's where you leave us a voicemail and we'll mention it on your birthday. That's a, This is a, a one-time offer. You leave <laughs> us a voicemail and we'll mention it on your birthday. So if you're new to the show, remember to subscribe on your podcast app to get new episodes delivered every week. Rate and review when possible. And we'll see you next week. Yeah, see you next week.